So let us start. Okay, uh, it is my uh, duty to um, uh, introduce the winners of the ESRB Research Prize uh, in memory of uh, Ike van der Berg. Ike uh, was, uh, in a way, a colleague of us. I mean, she was, uh, uh, she was a member of the ESRB Advisory Scientific Committee from 2011 to 2014. Uh, she was also a member of the European Parliament until 2009. And uh, unfortunately, she died uh, um, at, towards the end of her mandate as a member of the Advisory Scientific Committee. And she was a great colleague to have uh, on the Advisory Scientific Committee. And um, this prize is dedicated to her memory. And uh, since Ike very much um, um, held, uh, held very high the notion that uh, finance should uh, serve society and not the opposite. Uh, this prize uh, was created by the Advisory Scientific Committee in this spirit, and so is dedicated to um, uh, excellent researchers uh, who uh, do work uh, on uh, uh, systemic uh, risk, on uh, macroprudential policy, and also to consumer protection in finance. And in fact, uh, last year, which was the first edition of this prize, the prize was won by Celerier and Ballet with an excellent paper on retail products complexity and therefore consumer protection issues. And this year, the winners of the prize uh, are Sergei uh, Chernenko, so these are ex equo winners. Sergei Chernenko from Ohio State uh, who, with a paper joined with Adi Sundar from Harvard University, and Matthias Effing with a paper, um, uh, with a, I mean, both papers will be presented uh, uh, very, very soon. Uh, it's a solo paper instead in the case of Matthias. Now, um, uh, I also want to say that uh, there were two runners up uh, whose papers as well as those of the winners are already part uh, of the ESRB working paper series. So without any further ado, I give the floor to uh, the, winner, the winners for a, a brief uh, a presentation of the, their, uh, the key points of their paper. Uh, well, let's go, go in alphabetical order, so Sergei okay. uh, uh, first and Matthias uh, next. Oh. If it's okay, otherwise we can... Oh, it's fine. Uh, and this is, okay, all right. Oh, why do we just disappear? Oh, all right. Okay. It's here. Um, thank you, Marco, for the great introduction. And uh, thank you to the selection committee for picking um, my paper with Audi to be the joint winner. Uh, very honored uh, to receive the prize. Um, so the paper is interested in measuring and understanding liquidity transformation and asset management. Uh, we know that liquidity transformation or the creation of liabilities that are more liquid than the underlying assets is a key function of many financial intermediaries, right? banks being a quintessential example. Uh, since the crisis, there's been an increasing realization and a spirit, spirited public policy debate on the extent to which um, liquidity transformation by asset managers can cause similar financial stability issues. Uh, and here, the concerns basically center on the interaction of what we might call performance flow relationship and fire sales, right? With the basic uh, concern being about uh, negative performance by a manager leading investors to withdraw capital, forcing the manager to sell some of the assets as fire sale prices, and basically kind of like creating this loop. And these kind of concerns are especially prevalent and plausible given that a lot of the growth since the crisis has been in uh, strategies that invest in less liquid assets. Uh, so here's one example from the US. It's the growth of loan mutual funds. These are open-end mutual funds that effectively promise investors next day liquidity, but invest in syndicated loans which basically an interesting fact about this market is that these loans basically settle T plus 14. So it takes two weeks for them to settle while the fund promises next day liquidity to its investors. Right? Uh, an example closer to home might be the UK property funds that had to suspend redemptions following the uh, vote about Brexit. Now, notwithstanding kind of like anecdotal cases like this, a key empirical challenge uh, in this debate is really the difficulty of measuring liquidity transformation in asset management. Uh, for banks, things are relatively straightforward. 
maturity mismatch is a fairly good measure of how much liquidity transformation a bank is performing. For asset managers, things are more complicated, right? Because in principle, the assets are tradable securities. Also, the price impact can be at least partially uh, passed on to the investors, right? Uh, nevertheless, op uh, asset managers such as Open End mutual funds do perform some liquidity transformation. And effectively, the way that it works is that they pool transaction costs across investors. Okay? And so if you're an investor in an open-end mutual fund, you can, in principle, withdraw unlimited quantities at the end of um, day net asset value right, without internalizing the transaction cost and the price impact that you're basically effectively imposing on all of the remaining investors in the fund. And that's what basically effectively uh, what it does is that it flattens the price, uh, the price quantity schedule that you face as an investor and makes the assets more liquid for you to trade in the mutual fund than potentially trading in the underlying securities, which might be corporate bonds or like properties, like in the example of UK property funds. Right. Now, so how do we gonna try to measure how much liquidity transformation uh, funds are really performing? Uh, so the key idea in the paper is to take a revealed preference approach and to argue that the way that mutual funds manage their own liquidity helps shed light on how much liquidity transformation they're performing. And specifically, how aggressively funds use cash to accommodate investor uh, redemptions and subscriptions, so net fund flows, and the level of cash holdings are gonna be measures of liquidity transformation. So the first one should be relatively intuitive, right? If a fund was investing in perfectly liquid assets, there would be no need for cash, and it would be simply transacting uh, in the underlying securities immediately whenever it receives uh, net fund flows. Uh, the, the second one might be a little bit more counterintuitive, right? From the perspective that if you force a fund or an asset manager to hold more cash, then mechanically it's gonna be performing less liquidity transformation. The extreme would be, a fund that holds 100% cash, well, it's, it's not performing any liquidity transformation at all. Right? But the key to recognize here is that funds are gonna be, asset, and asset managers are gonna be setting their cash holdings optimally, and they are gonna be doing this to mitigate some of their expected liquidation costs. And so the funds that invest in less liquid assets and provide more liquidity to the investors, so have more volatile fund flows, are gonna be the ones that are gonna hold more cash in equilibrium. Okay? Although their cash holdings are not gonna be fully enough to uh, offset the higher expected liquidation costs. Okay? So that's the basic idea. Uh, we take it to the data uh, using data on US open-end mutual funds and basically find results that are consistent with um, sizable amount of liquidity transformation taking place in mutual funds. Uh, so first of all, from the dynamic perspective, even at a one month horizon, which is fairly long in asset management, a big fraction of net fund flows is accommodated through changes in cash, as opposed to trading in the underlying securities. And it's more so the case when uh, the fund invests in less liquid securities. Okay. Also, the level of cash holdings is strongly related to kind of proxies for liquidity transformation, the ones that I mentioned before, asset liquidity and flow volatility. And there is an important interaction effect between the two that basically for funds that have very liquid assets, the volatility of investor fund flows doesn't matter for their cash holdings. So these funds are kind of clo close to the frictionless ideal. Right. The typical fund, however, is far, relatively far away from that, and so for the typical fund, uh, in the data, uh, f uh, flow volatility is gonna have a substantial effect on uh, its cash holdings. Right. Now, this is kind of like validation of the basic idea. What can we do with this? One thing that we can think about is the extent to which uh, funds internalize their price impact. Uh, so in the paper, we have a simple model, uh, but also both our, the simple model in the paper and most theories would suggest that funds right, will not hold enough cash to fully internalize the price impact that uh, they're imposing on other market participants, right? Uh, and that is basically the counterpart of the more standard leverage fire sale externality. Okay? Now, what we're gonna do empirically is look for settings where there is likely to be more internalization of the price impact. 
Right? One setting you can think of is that the mono monopolist would fully internalize own price impact. If I own all of the security, I fully internalize any price impact in that security. And so what we find is that funds that hold a larger fraction of the outstanding amount of the securities that they invest in, either equities or bonds, hold substantially more cash than other funds. The second setting, uh, uh, second idea, is that funds may partially internalize the price impact that they impose on other funds within the same mutual fund family. So we measure overlap in holdings between the fund and other funds inside the family, and funds that have greater overlap with other funds in the family tend to hold more cash, okay? consistent with them worrying about the price impact that they might be imposing on other funds, on other related funds. Okay. Now, one implication of this analysis is to say that since most funds do not fully internalize their price impact, like the special funds that we're looking here, the kind of like the monopolist idea and the overlap idea, since most funds are not close to that, they're gonna hold too little cash relative to um, what an agent coordinating across all of the funds would have them hold. The second uh, sort of like extension or of this kind of idea is to look at the effects of cash holdings on stock fragility. Okay? So the idea here is to measure at the stock level the cash holdings of the funds that hold the, the particular stock. And if the stock is held by funds with abnormally low cash holdings, it's potentially gonna be more fragile because if investors withdraw capital from the funds holding the stock, the funds might have to sell it, right, to liquidate it, and engage in forced fire sales, as a result potentially introducing uh, excess volatility in the stock, okay? So in this analysis, what we do is we first of all, at the fund level, calculate sort of this adjusted cash to assets ratio, which is, tells us how much cash you have relative to like sort of our model uh, relative to other funds uh, within the same objective, sort of size, age, et cetera. And then at the stock level, we calculate uh, the average cash to assets ratio of the funds holding the stock. Okay. So we do this at time t, uh, and this is what you see on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the daily stock return volatility over the subsequent quarter. What you see is that fun uh, stocks that are held by um, funds with lower cash holdings are more volatile. And this is especially the case where uh, the stock has a relatively high mutual fund share, so a relatively high fraction of the stock is held by mutual funds. Okay. Uh, and another ex extension that we're working on is using this revealed preference approach to think about corporate bond liquidity. There's been a lot of concerns about deterioration in corporate bond liquidity since the financial crisis. Now, if you look at kind of like standard measures that academics have of liquidity in the corporate bond market, uh, they are basically similar to pre-crisis levels. So you see these measures of liquidity spiking during crisis, but then they come down and they're similar to what they were before crisis, if not even better. Uh, the caveat to, these, to the standard measures, of course, is that they're based on transactions. You can only measure them for bonds that do trade it's difficult to say what's the sort of like latent liquidity for bonds that do not trade. And the fraction of bonds for which you cannot measure, you measure standard measures of liquidity has actually been trending up, okay? Uh, so this is where the revealed preference approach can help. We can look uh, across bonds at the relationship between cash holdings and flow volatility this relationship should be stronger the more illiquid the bond is, right? Uh, and we can construct these measures and see how they change over time and for different bonds, right? And so, uh, and, and kind of like a couple of nice things about this approach is that we're not limited to looking at the transactions and we don't take, have to take a stand on sort of like what's the relevant measure of liquidity. It's sort of like what funds really care about. Um, so, basically, to conclude, we take a revealed preference approach to uh, measuring liquidity transformation in mutual funds. We find evidence uh, of a sizable amount of liquidity transformation. And kind of two implications that 
I want to touch on one is that liquidity transformation and asset management is dependent on liquidity provision by the traditional banking and shadow banking systems. And that's in a sense that in order to provide liquidity to their own investors, asset managers such as open and mutual funds that we're looking at hold large amounts of cash and equivalents. And a lot of these assets are basically short-term liabilities of the banking sector. So things that affect liquidity provision by the banking sector will potentially have effects on liquidity provision by the asset management sector. Um, and the other implication that I already mentioned before is that uh, despite their size, cash holdings of mutual funds might not be large enough to completely mitigate their price impact externalities. Thank you. Thank you very much. But yes. So. Yes, we present. Okay. So both papers are about uh, uh, you know macro prudential uh, stuff more than last year's paper, which was more about consumer protection. Okay. So let me also thank the scientific committee committee for this honor to to be here today. Uh, I'm very grateful to share the prize with Sergey. Um, so this paper is going to be about investments into the securitization market, or in what I use as an umbrella term, asset-backed securities. And I'm going to look at investments by banks in Germany. And more specifically, I'm going to look at how considerations for regulatory arbitrage are going to influence these investments. Um, so the regulatory framework for asset-backed securities uh, came under fire during and after the financial crisis, and it has been reviewed by academics and the media, but importantly also by regulators. So for example, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision looked at its own regulatory framework under Basel II and tried to identify weaknesses or shortcomings in capital requirements for asset-backed securities. And one important weakness that they identified uh, was the mechanic reliance of capital requirements on external credit ratings, as those issued by Moody's Standard Poor's and Fitch. And there are four different lookup tables. Well, it depends on the approach. But basically, you have a mapping of the credit rating of the asset-backed security into risk weights, which will then be mapped into a capital requirement. And uh, the fear was that these credit ratings, and hence the capital requirements, would not be sufficiently sensitive to risk. To make this point more clear, let me show you these box plots where on the horizontal axis, you have different rating buckets that roughly correspond to regulatory buckets. So securities inside one rating bucket have similar and often even identical capital requirements. But still, if you look at the distribution of yield spreads in these different boxes, you see quite a lot of dispersion in the market price for risk. Um, more importantly, or not more importantly, but also uh, to note is that the relation between the credit rating and hence the capital requirements and the yield spreads is not even monotonic. So for example, um, a bank could buy a high yielding A plus rated security um, rather than a security with a similar yield spread in the A minus or even triple B bucket uh, and without incurring higher capital requirements. Overall, if you take the correlation between capital requirements and yield spreads, the correlation is only 0.5. And if you compute the, an approximation for the return on the capital required for an ABS investment, you also see a lot of dispersion. If you use the ratio of the yield spread and the capital requirement for one euro invested as an approximation for this return on the equity required by the regulator, you see a lot of dispersion, and especially at the higher end of the rating scale. So especially A plus rated securities can have very high returns on equity. Um, and the question now is whether banks will exploit that and which banks, maybe those that are constrained by the regulator more than others. And then what does it tell us about the effectiveness of the regulatory framework that was in place for an asset class that was at the core of the financial crisis? So. The way I tried to get at this question was to look at data maintained by the German Central Bank, the Bundesbank, um, that records exactly how much a given bank in Germany has invested into one specific asset-backed security, so security-level data. And it allowed me to estimate the probability that a given bank would buy a given asset-backed security as a function of the yield spread and the capital requirement. And this figure summarizes the 
first result of the paper. So on the horizontal axis, you see the cross-section of banks ordered by how constrained they are by regulation, by their capital adequacy ratio. Banks with low capital adequacy ratios over here have relatively tight regulatory constraints. For them, it can, uh, regulatory capital is scarce. And banks at the right-hand side, they have less regulatory constraints. From the regulatory perspective, they appear better capitalized. And then here on the vertical axis of the figure, you see the effect of an increase in the yield spread on the probability that the bank will buy a given asset-backed security, conditional on its regulatory treatment. So take, for example, a constrained bank with a low capital adequacy ratio at the boundary of 8%, and take the green dashed line, which is the A-plus bucket. And you see that if you increase the yield spread of an A-plus rated security by one percentage point, the probability that the bank will buy the security goes up by four percentage points. And this is similar for the orange line, that's for A-rated, for the brown line, which is for double A-rated, and for, blue, for the blue line for triple A-rated securities. And that correspond, corresponds roughly to these rating buckets that I showed you in the previous figure, so it's consistent. Second, um, I would like to, to take away from this graph that the effects disappear as you move to the right. So banks that, are, that have lax regulatory constraints don't appear to reach for yield. They, seem not, they do not seem to um, exploit the low yield or risk sensitivity of capital requirements of ratings. Um, now the question is, what does it mean for the effectiveness of the regulatory framework? Um, how big is the problem? And I would like to discuss this figure in this context. The horizontal axis is the same. Again, you have the cross-section of banks, where on the left-hand side you have the constrained banks with low capital adequacy ratios, and on the right-hand side, those banks that appear better capitalized in the eyes of the regulator. And this brown line here is an estimate of the yield spread of the average asset back security bought by a given bank. So, for example, a bank with a low capital adequacy ratio here, on average buys asset-based securities that have a yield spread of 110 basis points. And what you see is that constrained banks tend to reach for yield. They buy securities with higher yields or higher market price of risk than unconstrained banks. And now, next I'm going to plot the risk weight of the average position taken by the banks. And you see that constrained banks, even though they buy securities with higher yield spreads, they buy securities that on average have a lower regulatory risk weight. Whereas unconstrained banks, they incur higher capital requirements. It might not be bad for them because they are, uh, regulatory capital might be abundant in these institutions. They might attach a different shadow value to, uh, to capital. But the takeaway is that the securities bought by these institutions appear riskier, at least if you interpret the yield spread as some proxy for, for risk that is compensated by the market, but nevertheless, they have lower risk weights, which is against the idea that riskier investments should have higher capital requirements. In that sense, the regulatory framework seems to, deal less, seems to do less well than for other asset classes, let's say. Um, coming back to this approximation for the promised return on the capital that the regulator requires for a given investment, so not return on equity for the entire bank, but what's the return on the capital that you need to use to fund one specific ABS uh, position, investment? If you compute this approximation, um, you see that a relatively constrained bank on the left can have a promised return on equity of 46%, which is very high and which can be realized due to the extremely low capital requirements. And the systematic choice of the highest yielding securities in the buckets. This relatively unconstrained bank has a four times lower return on equity on average for the average asset back security purchased. And um, the conjecture is that if you can increase the return on the equity required by the regulator for an investment by a factor of four, or let it be a factor of three or two, that still maps into a significant increase in risk of the position. Um, so then in the next step, I looked at the exposed performance. What are the implications of this behavior um, 
And I see that the constraint banks on the left-hand side here, they tend to allocate more um, of their portfolio to the lemons in the market, in the sense that they buy more securities whose collateral will perform worse exposed. Nine months after investment, I see that the ABS bought by these banks here have a higher delinquency rate, so more of the collateral that backs the ABS is delinquent, than the collateral here, the ABS bought by the relatively unconstrained banks. Okay, so I don't know how am I doing on time. I have the impression that it was really fast. <laughs> um, subjective bias. Uh, so to conclude, this is a paper on um, the buy side of the securitization market. To be sure, there are other papers on the demand for asset-backed securities, but either they look at aggregated data or they look at other investors. Sergey has a paper, for example, he looks at funds and investment companies. But for banks, we know very little what determines their investments into this um, asset class that became uh, very famous during the financial crisis. And we see that banks actually exploit the low risk sensitivity of rating contingent risk weights for asset-backed securities. I call this regulatory arbitrage, but you might call it differently. And what is maybe worrying is, is that in particular those banks that appear fragile, at least from the perspective of the regulator, so those with low capital adequacy ratios, um, that they are evading the very capital requirements that were designed to, to limit their risk taking. Um, I believe that the extent of this, what I call regulatory arbitrage, is economically large. And um, the question is where we go from here. Um, so I just found out yesterday that um, the Basel Committee redrafted revisions to the securitization framework. I think it became public in July 2016. And they reiterated that they are going to move further to internal credit ratings rather than using external credit ratings to de determine capital requirements. Question is, will they be more risk sensitive? Um, alternatively, people have brought forward other ideas like calibrating risk weights to market measures of risk, yield spreads, for example. Rocher did that very early in 1990, 1992. The question is, of course, how liquid are prices and how easily can this be achieved? Okay, thank you. Okay, just a, a few words about uh, both papers. First of all, uh, basic recommendation, read them because they're worth it. Uh, I read them several times in, uh, you know, I was part of the committee within the SRB uh, uh, picking them uh, among a vast set of uh, people who submitted uh, work and they're really uh, good papers. And they're good papers because they um, look at uh, new data and they provide new pieces of evidence on, uh, on uh, issues which uh, are uh, highly under-researched. The paper by Sergei uh, belongs uh, is, uh, to a, a, an area of research which is uh, very important for the ESRB and for all prudential, macroprudential uh, regulators because uh, he looks uh, at uh, issues which are relevant for the prudential regulation of non-banks, which is an issue that uh, we have already discussed uh, yesterday, came up uh, yesterday, and uh, which is increasingly important. So uh, um, the, the question is whether, uh, for instance, mutual funds uh, or other financial intermediaries which are non-banks uh, are holding uh, a sufficient uh, buffers in general, uh, in particular in this case uh, liquidity buffers um, or not. And uh, this is an issue, for instance, on which the ESRB has already done a study based on uh, questionnaires uh, to uh, 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 asset managers uh, to uh, ask, first of all, what is their perception of their own liquidity, of their own liquidity buffers in response to possible um, market movements and so on. And uh, then uh, there, there is uh, uh, a second questionnaire, which I don't remember if it was, has already been uh, um, uh, you know, uh, done or not. On second round effects uh, and stuff like that. So it is, uh, you know, stress testing in a way of these uh, 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 of these institutions uh, uh, is increasingly important in uh, prudential regulation. The paper makes a claim which, w I mean, is very important from the point of view of a macroprudential regulator. Uh, it says that they have evidence that funds do not fully internalize the effect that provide, uh, providing investors with daily liquidity has on the prices of the underlying securities. 
this. I'm not completely convinced that actually they show this, but uh, to the extent that they can actually substantiate this point, this is quite important because, of course, it opens potentially the role for intervention by a, a macroprudential regulator in the form, for instance, of um, either uh, uh, recommending or forcing uh, mutual fund um, uh, managers to hold more liquidity than they currently do or uh, other uh, uh, interventions. But it, I, I would like to make sure that really, really in the paper there is evidence uh, uh, for this. There is another piece of evidence that uh, Sergei actually mentioned uh, just at the end on his last slide uh, of his presentation, which I think is very important from the point of view of a macroprudential regulator. And it is that the form in which this liquidity is held by these mutual funds is essentially deposits with banks or with shadow banks or money market funds. And this belongs to another area which is under you know, the uh, uh, spotlight of the ESRB, which is essentially interrelationship between uh, you know, uh, non bank and uh, bank uh, um, uh, intermediaries uh, in the provision of liquidity. So imagine that, for instance, uh, e there is a shock to, to bank uh, uh, solvency or to shadow banks' uh, solvency. Then this is telling us that uh, these guys, these mutual fund managers, will have problems in drawing on, upon their liquidity, which they set aside in order to face possible shocks to uh, uh, their uh, net uh, uh, inflows or out outflows. And so essentially, there is a potential interrelation relationship between liquidity of banks and liquidity of these intermediaries. So it is all very interesting stuff uh, from the point of view of macroprudential regulation. The paper by Matthias uh, is also very important because uh, it provides the first piece of evidence based on micro data, as he mentioned, uh, uh, regarding banks uh, uh, on uh, regulatory arbitrage of risk weights. And he explains uh, uh, very well the fact that uh, uh, the way risk weights were set, at least, uh, uh, I mean, looking at this data for German banks, uh, pushes or induces uh, um, or lets at least uh, banks uh, which are um, uh, you know, uh, more constrained by regulation to actually engage in uh, purchases of riskier securities because these uh, uh, provide, promise them a return on required equity which is about four times as large as for unconstrained uh, banks. Yet exposed, uh, they have the lowest exposed performance within each risk weight bucket. So essentially, uh, uh, risk weights appear to be utterly, utterly counterproductive the way they are set because they both increase or at least allow an increase uh, in risk taking uh, by the wrong banks, so the constrained banks, so the riskier banks, but, but also exposed, uh, they, uh, these banks do uh, worse with them. And then, you know, towards the end, Matthias was uh, going already in that direction. This begs the policy question of what to do. I mean, these risk weights are, are uh, clearly not well uh, set, so uh, should we scrap them? Should we base them on more like finer, uh, uh, um, you know, on basis of finer measures than? Uh, uh, um, then um, credit rating agencies' uh, ratings, uh, but then uh, which ones uh, should be the actual yields or should be the CDS premium when they're available? These also have uh, uh, problems, as he, uh, his ma he mentioned. Should we go for uh, limits to large exposures? Of course, these are very hot issues, not only for micro uh, prudential regulation, uh, um, existing one, but also for future possible one. Uh, you know, imagine that we, uh, as we were mentioning before, with uh, in the previous session, we have positive risk weights or non necessarily zero risk weights for sovereign bonds. You know, this all becomes uh, highly relevant also in in, uh, in that case. So, of course, uh, this begs a lot of uh, questions, but at least we know that there are things that don't work over and above the procyclicality, which is the gen generally the issue which is raised above uh, um, risk weights based on uh, credit rating agencies' uh, uh, ratings. Okay, let me finish here. I wish uh, you uh, best of luck with the publication of this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.